BBC Radio 2's Liverpool season, celebrating the European capital of culture 2008. BBC Radio 2. It really is hard to believe standing here in Liverpool city centre beside a bar which is now hosting a karaoke evening that this building was once responsible for one of the most exciting and maverick music scenes in the UK. Not only did it see gigs by local heroes like Echo and the Bunnymen and Teardrop Explodes, orchestral manoeuvres in the dark and wire heat, it nurtured Liverpool talent who would go on to have huge success in the top 40. Frankie Goes to Hollywood drank here, Ian Brodie from the Lightning Seeds was a regular, not to mention Bill Drummond who was one half of the K left and Pete Burns of Dead or Alive. All of them used to congregate in a venue which was born out of the Liverpool Underground's discovery and love of the punk scene, but which in time would then go on to forge a new wave of British pop. I'm Steve Lamack and welcome to the first instalment of our new occasional series Halls of Fame. Fittingly, we begin here on Matthew Street in the centre of Liverpool, where I'm standing outside, well, the world-famous Cavern Club to my left, but this isn't a documentary about the Fab Four, this is more about the Crucial Three, because across the road is a building that in the late 70s was the home of Eric's nightclub. It was a subterranean hellhole. You're on a suicide mission, basically. Every left field oddball and screwball kid in the in the county and beyond, and it just dragged them. It was like a siren dragging them, dragging the kids towards the rocks. We'd never heard Max sing. He, he just kicked off on all this like weird rants about monkeys and stuff. One of the strengths and the weaknesses of the Teardots was we were into wacky ideas. We picked the most preposterous name we could think of because we wanted people to know it was a preposterous idea for a band. Here was the chance to get on a stage and you got on before me. How dare you? The idea was that it would be a music club that dealt with the best of all different kinds of genres of music. This then is the story of Eric's, the venue which changed the shape and sound of the Liverpool music scene. Ken Testy was tour managing Liverpool band Def School when he was approached by local promoter Roger Eagle and his co-conspirator Pete Fulwell. Between them, the pair had dreamt up a new project. In essence, they wanted to open a club in the city for music lovers. A club where they could play the tunes which had inspired them. A club that would bring bands to Liverpool who wouldn't usually get a gig in the city. And a club that would finally develop its own bands and its own scene. On October the 1st, 1976, that dream became a reality, as Eric's opened its doors for the first time. The club staged music rarely heard in other city centre venues, everything from jazz, reggae and folk music to performance art and poetry. And of course, the rapidly expanding underground music of the time, punk rock. I am Pete Fulwell. I was one of the uh, founders of Eric's, along with Roger Eagle and Ken Testy. We got together to form a music club. <laughs> That was the idea, was that it would be a music club that dealt with the best of all different kinds of genres of music. It was aimed at people that didn't necessarily go to clubs as well, that was the vision. You know, that was what we wanted to do, and, and to, to make it work financially would have meant turning it into something that we didn't want to do. So that was the, that was, that was the first highlight, was the realisation that you're on a suicide mission, <laughs> basically. But, you know, you have that kind of confidence at that stage in your life. Well, you know, you crash, you'll walk away from the wreckage, it won't kill you, you've got time to get on with the rest of your life, so do it. And that's, that was the attitude that we went into it with. I said something better change. And Roger, who was the uh, main person really musically involved in the club, an incredible guy, one of nature's educators, you know, he had a mission to educate people musically. Not always in the right direction, <laughs> but it didn't matter. Martin Dempsey from Liverpool band Yachts. It was Roger's enthusiasm that enthused all the people that came through the doors and it didn't matter what type of music it was, it could have been jazz, soul, funk, blues, reggae, you name it, it didn't really matter as long as it had an edge. You know, there was no interest in disco and there was no interest in straightforward chart pop. Anything that had an edge that was an alternative to mainstream, you know, that, that's what Eric would support and help to promote. Sometime Eric's DJ, Bernie Connors. <laughs> The yeah, first time I went in there, went in there, Roger Eagle, who was an absolute giant of a man, was behind the desk, the little office thing, 
and he told us to off, which we probably did. <laughs> and he was terrifying. But that never stopped us because there was, even though at that time I would have been 15, there was definitely a sense that there was something happening down there. Given the amazing amount of stories that would unfold within these four walls over the ensuing three and a half years, some of which you'll hear in this programme, you might be forgiven for thinking that the place itself was a giant, state-of-the-art, fully equipped social club. You couldn't be further from the truth. Doreen ran the door officially and unofficially ran the day-to-day -day business. We used to open in the daytime for me to do the membership cards and that's where everybody used to gather at between 12 and 2 o'clock lunchtime. I mean like Pete Wiley, he was actually at university at the time. He used to come down in his great lunch hour or whatever and hang around. Ian McCullough used to do the same. Brody used to do the same. They all used to hang around with me really, the office and and yeah, it was just dead laid back. That was the beauty of it, really. You know, the punters were involved. You'd walk through the door and somebody wouldn't have turned up to do the bar. And Roger would say, right, you on the bar. Bill Drummond went on to start the KLF. I was the odd job man. So my job there was to build walls, move bars, do the carpentry, bring in the barrels. Uh, bring in the gear, do the stage security. The move to encourage faces to frequent the place by offering certain people free membership would in the long run be the making and breaking of Eric's. Among the first influx of Eric's members was Pete Wiley. It all started 1st of October 76 in the middle of this really humdrum world. This really exciting thing exploded, and I, I know people use that word a lot these days, but it genuinely exploded. It, 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 once it started, its momentum got bigger and bigger, you know. So each week there'd be another great band, and a great support band, and it wasn't expensive, and you met great people, and every night was a great night. My name's Jen Casey, and I was an Eric's kid. I had a little vintage clothes store on Matthew Street before Eric's opened that everyone used to gather in. And this weird man came in and he was really tall and ungainly and he sort of bounded into my stall and he knocked clothes over and he said, you know, I've got some invites for you. I want you and your mates to come to the opening of my club. And then he bounded out again. And it was just such a weird thing because there was a group of us who, there was Pete Burns and there was Holly and there was me with my bald head and we could never get into clubs, you know? So we used to spend our Saturday nights getting knocked back by dorm and nobody would let us in. Occasionally we'd get into a gay club. So for this guy to come up and invite us to the opening of his club, it was quite a big deal and it was Roger Eagle. Bill Drummond again. The club drew upon all the people that didn't fit into other areas of whatever. And it was the kind of the odd bods in each class, I guess. You know, there's always somebody in a class that maybe doesn't quite fit in, whether it's to do with their sexuality, their, their physical appearance, or their other mindset. And that's what Eric seemed to draw. And they, whatever they were like was allowed there. Bands manager, Dave Wibberley. First went to Eric's in November 1976 as a 15 year old. When I first first walked into Eric's, what, what I saw was kind of what I aspired to in my dreams, in my, in my mind. I encountered people who were clearly wilder than me, wackier than me, brighter than me, more interesting than me, more out there than me. Jane Casey. Me and Bernsey and Holly and Paul Rutherford, we were getting battered. It literally, I mean, there's, Pete Burns came into my store one, one Saturday and he said, oh my God, they're selling off all the Bieber makeup in Birkenhead Market. And as we were walking around the market, the crowds were gathering and I said, look, Pete, all these people are following us. I think we should leg it out the market. There's a bus stop. Just jump on any bus that comes because we're going to get murdered. And the people turned the bus over to get to us. And it was the front page of the Echo that night that there'd been a riot in Birkenhead <laughs> and they turned a bus over. And then one day, something really weird happened. This new generation of kids came off the housing estates. And whereas their big brothers had hated us, they loved us. And every street we walked down, they wanted our autograph and they wanted to take photographs. Holly from Frankie Goes to Hollywood. 
It was a subterranean hellhole that smelled of rats' feces during the day. And then at night, it was this sort of phantasmagoria of musical otherworldliness. So it was uh, a magnet, really, for anyone interested in music or becoming a musician. Doreen Allen. Roger, obviously, was the music man there, and he booked the bands that he liked, whether there'd be, like, one person turning up or... 500 people, so that probably was quite haphazard. I mean, Roger only booked the bands, I think, that he liked. Shack manager, Yorkie. And I always thought Roger was amazing, an absolute hero. He used to always just uh, drag me over by the the infamous Eric's jukebox and just have a listen to this Yorkie, because he knew I liked like, uh, quite different experimental type things. And uh, I think the last thing he played me at Eric's was, uh, come over here, Yoki, have a listen to this, you'll like this. And it was an Australian nose flautist. And uh, I've (laughs) never heard anything like it to this day. And he made me stand there and listen to all of it. But the jukebox, I mean, everyone must have gone on about the jukebox. It was an education in itself, you know. Bill Drummond again. The fact that Roger Eagle booked all sorts of acts, you know, some people think of it in terms of being a punk venue, but you know, I saw Bertie Hanch there, I saw certain jazz people whose names I can't remember just now, and of course, Roger, we wanted to put on reggae acts as well, which a lot of people didn't weren't interested in, but I used to enjoy those. So I, I, I always loved the breadth of music, and the breadth of music that the DJ would play. Martin Dempsey again. I think Liverpool was more akin with New York than it was with London. And the fact that it was a port, there was far more um, integration with the kind of black community as well, because don't forget, Eric's did put on a lot of kind of seminal reggae acts at the time, because Roger was a major fan. Uh, and he introduced reggae and, and, and dub, especially to a lot of kids in this area. And it was also appreciated by kids in, the, in, in, in Liverpool Lane, and Toxeth, who came down to the gigs. My name's Paul Simpson. I was the original keyboard player in The Theatre Explodes and the singer with The Wild Swans. Legendary bands played there. Favourite gigs would be uh, the pop group supporting Perubu. Talking Heads. Will Sargent from Echo and the Bunnymen. It was just amazing. The place was just like sort of everybody that you can possibly like the police. Like I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the police, but the police were on. I think it was 25p or 75p to get in or something. You know, it's nuts when you think about it. It's suicide, Perubu, talking heads. Run, 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 run. Matty Street soon became the epicenter of a newly emerging boho scene, with days spent in the Armadillo Tea Rooms and nearby Probe Records, which was run by Jeff Davis. We got the place opened on the 14th of October 1976, and we had a lot of people through the door. And it sort of, the shop developed, really. I was immediately into punk, well, because I was into all sorts of music, really, but uh, punk was just so refreshing at the time. And we'd even started getting these singles, independent singles. We were the only shop outside of London that was selling this stuff, you know. And we got into reggae very early on as well. Bernie Connors again. Probe was like a beacon that drew oh, every left field oddball and screwball kid in the, in the county and beyond. And it just dragged them, it was like a siren dragging them, dragging the kids towards the rocks. The geographical location of it, like it's what, 80, 90 yards away from the probe to, to Eric's door to door. It was just inevitable that because what was happening in one place is that they fed off each other so, so easily and so well. Doreen Allen. When Eric's first opened, we had our office in Probe, Roger and Peace, and Ken didn't have the actual lease on the building. And then, of course, Probe was just around the corner, and the armadillo was opposite. And because I always used to go over and have me break over in the armadillo, and nobody could afford cups of tea, so I used to buy them a cup of tea <laughs> in the armadillo. I'm Martin Campbell. 
used to be the bass player with the Lightning Seeds, played for various people. My me, me, me older brother used to go and um, also bring back all the records from Probe and stuff. I used to sit up and, on the edge of my bed waiting for him to come in from Eric's and get all the gen off him, what had happened and what they were wearing, <laughs> who'd played and all that. Dave Wibbly again. When I say that the Eric scene was about more than just this club, it very much was, because I think the most exciting things that happened, the most Eric's things that happened, happened around wooden tables in the Armadillo Cafe, people sitting around in the daytime cooking up insane ideas. The leaders of the scene, the Bill Drummond kind of guys, and Pete Fulwell, teaching me, a 15-year-old, about situationism and about Dadaism. Teardrop Explode, Paul Simpson. The real kings and, well, queens of Eric's were, were Holly Johnson, Paul Rutherford, and Jane Casey. Um, they were just dangerously hip. There she goes again. She's out on the streets again. And a huge influence on me. They were so extreme. And I loved that thing that every week you'd try and look different. You'd scour the Oxfam shops and you'd customise your stuff. I, I, my dad was in, in the Merchant Navy and he had a big box of naval uniforms and stuff and I'd, I'd rifle through it. I, mean, I used to go to the club in a, in a radiation suit. We, I, I, my sister used to have, to have to have to tie me into the back of it. So just, just my face and my eyes were, uh, were visible. You know, it had no fly for, for urinating in, so uh, that didn't last too long. I loved that about it, you know, that was, that was a big, huge thing for me, almost as, as important as, as the music, you know. The fact that Eric's opened the same month as The Damned released the first ever punk single, New Rose, now seems somehow prophetic, but at the time, it was more of a happy accident. Pete Fulwell again. Eventually, the punk side of it dominated the club uh, and we were never totally comfortable with that we, because we, we saw it as a music club and the more people praised us for being a punk club the more kind of slightly uncomfortable we felt not that we were against punk because we were very for it but we thought it was more than that and we wanted it to be more than that Dave Balf from The Teardrop Explodes It was at the time of punk and for me it was completely interlinked with punk and and the, the whole aesthetic, the rock aesthetic year zero that punk created. I remember at, at Eric's they played a lot of dub and they had to play a lot of dub because there was about five records that you could play that were truly allowed to be played. Then literally maybe each week there was a couple more records that were part of punk and new wave as it was called then. So you had this tabula rasa time, it was this blank slate. And that was incredibly empowering, incredibly liberating. Pete Wiley again. We were just thinking, this is great, we can do anything. Patty Smith talked about the sea of possibilities on horses, and to me, that's what it was. It was about, it was a sea of possibilities. It was raging, it was coming in waves. It was each wave getting bigger than the one before. Dip in the veins, dip in to the sea, to the sea of possibilities. Dip in. Every time something new happened, there'd be instant responses and more momentum, you know, it was incredible. The first thing I saw of Eric's was this huge queue on Matthew Street of young men of a certain age waiting to get in to see the runaways. And I didn't think this looked very good or attractive at all. But uh, I think it was the next week or the week after they had the Sex Pistols on. Yacht's bassist, Martin Dempsey. Pistols gig, it wasn't um, well publicised, it was the first time I think they'd been outside of London anyway, and it was a gig that Roger just decided to put on because he got offered it. Didn't know what was going to happen, didn't know what audience he was going to get. We were the kind of art college band at the time, so we got the support slot. John Lydon, very quiet, didn't want to be in Liverpool particularly, I got the impression, but the early lads were quite um, friendly. Uh, Glenn Metlock borrowed my bass, which is an old frames bass. Great, inter interesting evening. The Pistols were entertaining, and every, you know they went, they went down okay, but it wasn't a kind of, it, it, it was no great shakes, it wasn't like they were going to change the world or anything like that. And some of the other gigs that went on around that point in time, 76, early 77, when we were listening to things like the Ramones and Talking Heads and television, etc. I mean, television were far more interesting to me than Sex Pistols at the time, as were perhaps Kraftwerk, etc., etc. We were looking for the kind of changes in things. Pete Wiley. We'd seen all the bands, the, you know, the Pistols, the Damned, Eddie and the Hot Rods even, you know, the Buzzcocks, McGrode. I just wanna love her like any other, what do I get? 
we saw Slaughter and the Dogs. We saw, I mean, we saw tons and tons of music. And uh, Year Zero was May the 5th, 77, The Clash. Everyone who made a great record in the next 10 years from Liverpool was there that night. Bill Drum and the Bunny Men. Budgie from Susie and the Banshees, Ian Brody from the Lightning Seeds, obviously Holly and Paul and Pete Burns and Jane Casey. We were all there, you know, and it was the... We were a clash town from that point on. Bernie Connors. The first time I saw The Clash, it's not so much sound. It's this thing. I guess, like, people might call it an atmosphere, but it was more than an atmosphere. It was terrifying. It was loud. It was aggressive. It was the electricity that was being generated by both the audience and the band and the building. Because the building definitely acts as a conductor for the energy that uh, to rise and just stops the whole thing from just basically falling into the, into the sewers, really, you know? I always remember this thing where there was no air it, it, and the air was like germaline and this guy in a boiler suit dancing this terrible cantilever dance just next to me at the front and I keep tapping him and saying look mate you're doing me heading and I say that I said if you don't stop dancing like a I'm gonna kill you it was Julian Cope and he said let's form a band instead So the Clash gig was the one, and that's the night me, and it was Max's 18th birthday, Ian McCulloch's 18th birthday, and we formed the Crucial Three that night. I'm Holly Johnson, and you're listening to The Story of Eric's on Radio 2. The list of groups who played Eric's reads like a who's who of punk, from the Stranglers and the Clash to the Buzzcocks and the Pistols. Ironically, though, with the fleeting exception of the Spitfire Boys, Eric's own homegrown music stable didn't really boast a single punk band. Big in Japan were one of the first Liverpool bands to have an impact. Their lineup included Bill Drummond, who would go on to start the KLF, Lightning Seed, Ian Brodie, Holly Johnson, producer in waiting Clive Langer, and frontwoman Jane Casey. Yeah, big in Japan, he was one of my favourites and still are, even though none of them would admit it, you know. Yorkie again. I always coined the phrase, which has been nicked, a super group in reverse, because it had Holly, Bill Drummond, uh, Budgie, Ian Brody, Jane Casey. It's like, you know, what happens there? Well, they were brilliant. <laughs> Fifth of May, 1977, myself, Clive Langer, Phil Allen, Kev Ward, and I were in the grapes uh, having a pint, and we were planning going to see The Clash. And Deaf School, who Clive Langer was kind of the MD of, were the next day going off to the States to start an American tour. But they weren't taking their crew and they weren't taking their gear. And Clive gave us strict instructions to form a band and when he got back from the States in a month's time he would join us. I mean because the whole punk thing was happening he felt I think they were onto the third album by then it wasn't really happening. So we went and saw The Clash next day we formed a band using all Death School's gear. Big in Japan's Jane Casey. It was the worst fans you'd ever seen in your life, but it looked amazing. There'd be me in my little swimming costume. I had the body of Pamela Anderson, but with the natural breasts. So all the boys used to go wild, because I used to wear these little tops that they couldn't stay inside, you know, so all the boys used to be at the front waiting for a breast to pop up. Holly Johnson. I had all these disparate egos from art school dropouts to um, which was Bill Drummond and Budgie the drummer. Ian Brody was like a Beatles fan 
strangely. He was the only one who could actually play his instrument to a fairly high standard. You know, it was a, a strange mixture of people. Big in Japan weren't a punk band exactly. It was sort of a bit artier than that, a bit more arch and knowing in, in a sense. But they were very much the house band. Pete Wiley. Liverpool's a city that loves a divide. It's a take side city. So you were either for Big in Japan because they were doing it, or you hated them. And we hated them. Even though they're all my mates now. Uh, and by hate, it wasn't some kind of light-hearted hate. It was they were the enemy because they, it was the chance to get on a stage and you got on before me. How dare you? And how dare people like you before they've liked me? So there was a bit of that going on. Um, I formed a band with Julian Cope and uh, Budgie and a guy called Griff called the Nova Mob. We actually formed just so we could start a petition to get Big in Japan to split up. And Big in Japan all signed it, which was great. And they did split up shortly after. I think uh, that's the power of the pen. All those people that went on to form the Bunnymen and the Teardrops were part of the Big in Japan audience who would you know, look and sneer and think, we can do better than that. And, you know, indeed they did. You know, it inspired them very much to form bands and, you know, get their act together rather than just talk about it, you know, or dream. In an inspired move well ahead of its time, Eric started to put on Saturday matinee gigs for under-18s. Former enemy hack and matinee regular, Kev McManus. XTC was the first one we got there. And there was a huge queue outside there of like similar-minded 15, 14, 16 year olds. And um, it, was, it was just like a whole, you know, whole new world for us. It was there. Uh, First time you, you you sort of hung out with people your own age, you're into the same stuff, and you got to see bands of your age on the John Peel show, and it was it was just like a real eye opener. Bands manager Dave Wibberley. All these, I mean, so many great bands coming through that are exciting and, and genuinely great, and they're in the enemy and they're in sounds um, every week, and you're reading about them, and you know you're not going to pass the doorman on a Saturday night. Kevin Fitzgerald was the only journalist filing copy from Eric's. I was actually too young to join the adult version of this, so I used to go to the matinees which they'd set up and I watched Iggy Pop from two feet away. When he walked on stage and tried to do his um, metallic KO shtick with a gang of ten-year-old Liverpoolians. I happened to mention it was his birthday, at which point the wild man of Michigan and Ann Arbor was greeted to a rousing chorus of happy birthday, dear Iggy, and he wasn't quite sure whether to do a kind of black backflip or cover himself in broken glass if he'd had any at the time. So he then went on to do his new values set with the most enormous smile on his face, bigger than the smile on the album cover, Lust for Life. I'm healthy as a horse. In retrospect, the audience at Eric's was almost as, if not more, important than the bands themselves. There were certain pockets of the Eric's crowd now thinking seriously about creating their own music. One of the first off the blocks was the crucial three, namely Julian Cope, Ian McCulloch and Pete Wiley. Nothing was recorded, they didn't even play a gig, but the men who would later individually bring the world the Killing Moon, Reward and the Story of the Blues had taken that all-important first step. What ensued was a grown-up version of musical chairs, as the musicians who frequented Eric's swapped bands on an almost weekly basis. Ken Testy was one of the three owners of Eric's. It was very difficult to actually keep an eye on who was playing with who because the same guys would turn up in different combinations each week. Uh, Pete Wiley was regularly playing with anyone and uh, it really was pretty pretty chaotic and I remember uh, Budgie was pretty much a house drummer. I mean he was, uh, I think he played with virtually everyone. Pete Fulwell. There were certain nights when some of the, the people who'd been in the audience kind of got up and started doing things, um, uh, and doing things with their own voice. They were looking for a voice of their own, which I, that was good. That was an aspect of the kind of spirit of it all that we, you know, all of us felt was really important. Holly Johnson. 
there were a million bands, it seemed, an ever-changing cast of different band names and, you know, different lineups uh, that evolved over the Eric's period. Yorkie was another character who now manages Shaq and produces their records. The, and the, the Bunny Man went to rehearse in his basement. You know, there was lots of uh, characters there, really. I bumped into Julian. Uh, who lived down our vale. And then he just said to me, um, you've got a basement, is it possible you could ask your mum if we can use it? And she of course said no. And then he asked again and I asked her and um, eventually she relented. And then put up with, you know, bands practicing in the cellar for like two or three years. And never complained, you know, she loved it. She always loved um, Mac's voice. I always remember uh, Mac going upstairs to use the loop. And she always told everyone they had to use the outside toilet, but Mac, because she really idolised it, could use our loo. And then she came to me and she said, like, you'll have to go up there, you know, he's been up there for ages, I'm sure he's taking drugs or something. And just as I was about to go up and see what he was doing, he came down the stairs, preening himself in the mirror. And he said, sorry Gladys, uh, I just washed my hair while I was up there. And she was like, you cheeky. But with a big smile on her face. No one else would have got away with it, you know. Orchestral manoeuvres in the dark, front man, Andy McCluskey. As well as the bands that played in Eric's, there was the jukebox and there was the DJ. And I think one of the seminal moments for myself and Paul Humphreys was standing in Eric's between bands and they played Warm Leatherette by The Normal. Warm. Leatherette. Paul and I looked at each other and went, somebody's doing what we want to do and they've already made a record. Bloody hell, we better hurry up. If we want to do something, let's get on stage. Had the, the balls to finally uh, say to Roger and Pete, you know, can we, uh, listen, we've got this mad idea, right? Two of us with a tape recorder playing kind of German electro -y type music. Can we come down and do it? He said, yeah, we stick it on on a Thursday. We picked the most preposterous name we could think of because we wanted people to know it was a preposterous idea for a band. And we literally were just going to do one, it was basically like, let's go and do it once. You know, it was a dare, literally it was a dare to go on stage in October of 1978. But one thing I do remember is we supported Joy Division, which wasn't a bad way to start, was it? <laughs> They'd just come over from Manchester. We all started forming our groups quicker and different personnel. A lot of overlap, like I was in a group called The Mystery Girls with Julian Cope and Pete Burns. And we supported Sham 69 and got legged down the street by skinheads. And I got head butted that night, wearing my mother's clothes and a toilet seat. And we formed the Crucial Three. Me, Mac, Julian, and my mate Spenner from school. And actually we were called, in the, again a Liverpool thing, I, I said, well we've got to have a really crap punk name, because everyone was coming up, you know, from Sid Vicious to, you know, Nasty Nick or whatever. And I said, well I want a really rubbish punk name, so I became Arthur Hostile, because it seemed a bit British, you know. Teardrop Explode. Paul Simpson. Well, I met Julian, he was the most enthusiastic person I'd ever met. Because the Liverpool thing is is the, you know, not only is the glass half empty, there's no glass, there's no table, there's no bar, you know, it's we're very sort of downer kind of people. Uh, but with humour, but Julian was just so enthusiastic about everything. We met a few other people through Eric's. Um, Mick Finkler was a friend of Pete Wiley's uh, playing guitar, and we just started. Um, Playing in my, my bed sit, hitting, uh, washing up bowls with paintbrushes for drums. Soon it became apparent that Julian Cope and his teardrop explodes were ready to take the deep breath. Good evening, Eric. So we call the teardrop explodes. Dave Balf. It was strange because Julian and Mac and Will and, uh, had all been hanging out and playing with each other in different flats, and um, as soon as it separated, different identities started to emerge and the bunny men were far more organic I think in in their approach and one of the strengths and the weaknesses of the teardrops was we were into wacky ideas we'd say why are we doing like this why are we doing like that rather than just staying true to a kind of rock feel and we shove in strange ingredients and that sometimes worked, but sometimes it slightly made it maybe a bit too wacky or a bit too light-hearted maybe than, than it was meant to. Okay. 
also one of the things I liked about it, we weren't very good musicians. None of us were. I mean, the Beatles weren't great musicians when they started. Um, you, I like the way that one's creativity has to make up for a lack of skill. When you don't have the ability to do that, you have to invent new tricks. So it, it stimulates creativity and ability. This one now comes in a blue bag, it used to come in a red bag. It's called Sleeping Gas. Julian Cope from Teardrop Explodes, speaking in the early 80s. The initial Liverpool scene, which I would say was us, the Burning Man, Pink Military, orchestral manoeuvres, the attitudes of the groups were very, very similar. It was very, very much a case of help, self-help, just a, a real desire to do something that was new, and to do something that was new within melo um, a melodic structure, melody and weirdness combining the two, combining to get something that's a little bit bizarre, you know, that kind of early Pink Floyd is, is like a good analogy, I think, where you get something like See Emily Play, which is a pop song, but it's, it's off the wall as well. Eric's regular, Bernie Connors. It was very savvy, Kobe. Like a little Hoover, going around sucking up little bits and pieces of everything that he loved, which and reassembling them in his own image. At the same time, while most of, a lot of the Liverpool bands were like ding a ding a ding a ding a ding, one two three four, he was already he he had a, a good musical knowledge before punk, and they was they were so different. Thank you. Messrs McCulloch and Sargent, armed with their drum machine Echo, weren't far behind. Pete Wiley had told me that Mac could sing. The Bunny Men's Will Sargent. We, there was a party, and he was there on his own, just sitting there. And I thought, oh, well, you know, I'd sort of knew him, his face from round Eric's. And I just said to him, oh, uh, what are you doing? He said, he said, I'm waiting for the gift of vision, which is like, you know, it's like a Bowie lyric and everything. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and, uh, we just started making these little tapes and stuff and just sort of took off from there. The Teardrop Explodes had just sort of started out. They, they hadn't had a record out or anything. Either. And he said, well, we're doing this party. Do you want to support us? We just said, yeah, OK. And we hadn't done anything. We had, we had, I think we had a guitar. I had a drum machine because I was into Eno and stuff, you know, Kraftwerk and people like this. And I knew that they had some sort of weird things called drum machines. And... Um, Les, who was, you know, also used to go to Eric's, was sort of used to hang around with us. And he said, oh, I'll play bass. And he'd never played bass in his life. Like, this was on the Sunday, and the gig was on the Wednesday. And it was just the drum machine. I had started off the drum machine, was ticking away. And Les had the bass, just doing this repetitive bass thing. And um, we'd never heard Max sing, even all the times he'd been coming to my house for, for a few months. Never heard him sing anything, you know. He, he just kicked off on all this, like, weird rant about monkeys and stuff and the evolution and all that. And we were like, what the hell is this? And it, it sounded amazing, you know. It was like, it was so out there. It was, nobody else was doing anything like that. And we went on for about 12 minutes just doing this repetitive thing and everyone was like mesmerised. There was all the sort of Eric's uh, glitterati, you know, Holly Johnson and uh, Jane Casey and all these people. And they all came back afterwards and said, that was amazing. Boys of the sea, brains in the pocket, girls of the sea, knock it and rock it. Casey again. I just thought they were the best thing that I'd ever seen. I thought they were absolutely incredible. Ian had sort of, oh, he looked amazing. He had this little red jumper on with a slit neck, a bit bowyish, you know, and he looked so beautiful. And then later on, Pete DeFraitis replaced the drum machine, and then, you know, they were the best band in the world at that moment. They were fantastic. I beat up to be office manager Doreen Allen. I, I remember being with Ian McCulloch one day and 
he asked me to buy him a cup of tea. He said, you know, will you buy me a cup of tea in the armadillo? And I was meeting my mum at the time and she was standing outside, so I had him with me, you know. And I had to pay 10p for his cup of tea. And then a couple of weeks later, he was on top of the pops. And it was my mother really freaked out. She said, you had to buy him a cup of tea the other week. <laughs> and there he is on top of the pops. Which I, that was very amusing. Lightning Seed, Martin Campbell. It was just great to, I remember, you know, seeing the likes of the bunny men on top of the pops. And that was, that was just mind blowing. These were people that lived down the road from you, or, you know, a couple of miles away. And they were there doing it. They were exactly the same as you saw them walking down the street, you know. They had the same ripped jeans on and dirty shoes and stuff like that, and it was, it was brilliant. Echo and the Bunnyman frontman, Ian McCulloch. We started in seven, late 78, um, always more influenced by you know the 70s New York thing and, and Bowie when I was a kid when I'd, I'd just always play Bowie and Lou Reed and Velvet Underground cassettes and then when we got a record player when I was about 15 records I mean it was a, a good period in Liverpool generally you know that being in this band that I thought was the most special thing in the world I thought and still do think that the bunny man have got something or has as a, a thing got something that no other band I've ever heard has got. And it's, it's not just about the music, it's about where we stand. There's some beauty there that um, it's like crystal, you know. It makes me feel proud. Not to be outdone, the third of the crucial three, Pete Wiley, had been constructing War Heat. I become much more of a a competitive person than I've ever been. So if they're doing that, I'm going to beat them. So I go away and start writing songs, and uh, I wrote Better Scream and Hey Disco Joe, which was the B-side in Seven Minutes of Midnight, and Pete Fulwell said to me, when are you going to do something? I said, well, I've got this new band, you know, and he said, right, I'm putting you in the studio, and if you don't come, I'm barring you from Eric's. So we went away and I recorded the four songs and Ian Brody's talked about this and Max talked about it and Bill Drummond's talked about it and Julian's talked about it. When they heard Better Scream, our first single, they all shit themselves, you know, <laughs> which is a great feeling and I'm, I'm, I'm really glad, but he never told me that at the time, you know. This is Andy McCluskey from OMD and you're listening to the story of Eric's on Radio 2. Pivotally at this time, Bill Drummond from Big in Japan had pulled resources with Dave Balfe to start Zoo Records. Soon they were both label and management to the Bunnyman and Teardrop Explodes. Bill said, well, I was thinking of starting a record label. I said, that sounds like a good idea, can I do it with you? And for reasons that I've asked him numerous times in the decade since, he said yes. I suspect it was because I had a car, um, but it might be that he reckoned he could see some quality in me that was nascent in the extreme at that time. But we ended up doing the zoo thing, and um, we started off with a kind of posthumous EP made up of existent um, demos of A Pig in Japan, which we cobbled together into an EP. And it did really well, and uh, it paid off an overdraft they had. Now, I'd, I'd bumped into Julian a couple of times and he was telling us, but he was always telling us about whatever latest band he had. And and then he said he had the Teardrop Explodes. I remember bumping into him on Matthew Street saying, oh, well, we've got a label, maybe we should do something. Around, so they ended up doing a gig and we all turned up the gig very expectantly and they were great and they had the Bunnymen supporting them. And they were really good. We said, let's do a record, and, and we did one, and it was that simple. Pete Fulwell, Ken Testy, and Roger Eagle had also been dabbling in putting out records. They'd forged a link with some friends in Manchester, although things didn't quite work out. Pete Fulwell. 
we uh, at the club Eric so we were having a, a, a quite a few kind of local bands orchestral maneuvers in the dark being one of them uh, coming to us wanting us to put their records out you know indie labels uh, and we put one or two things out on Eric's uh, label but we were desperately short of money because nobody really knew we couldn't let the creditors know but we were on a knife edge we didn't really have the finance to do it Ken Testy. Tony Wilson, after many visits to Eric's, he developed his own club and we booked the acts for him. And it, there was a good deal of traffic. At that point, we were now exporting acts from Liverpool. And Eric's were all, already producing uh, records on Eric's label. And that was something that Tony Wilson uh, was interested in doing. It was decided that because Liverpool and Manchester were so far from London, if they were going to take major labels on, it would make sense to combine forces. With, uh, with Pete Fulwell, we decided to do a, a joint label, which was going to be Eric's Factory. It was conceived that uh, a double EP would be released with one EP from uh, Liverpool, one from Manchester. Uh, OMD were going to be the, the Liverpool acts on that, and I think Joy Division were going to be the, the, the Manchester Act. I checked out with Rough Trade, who were the, the big independent uh, distributors, to, to get an idea of how many they thought we might be able to sell. They came up with a figure, of, um, I think it was about 10,000 they felt was safe. So I did some kind of number crunching and you know, here, here's, here's how we could go forward and start this thing happening. And I arranged a meeting over in Manchester with, with Tony and I put the idea to him and uh, it was like, yeah, let's go. But what I was suggesting was that we called the label Eric factory so we have the two things uh, and we started the game off um, I thought <laughs> off it went but then suddenly this first factory release came about uh, that wasn't you know was just Manchester but with those bands on Andy McCluskey from OMD Pete and Rog uh, said um, listen we've got this kind of reciprocal relationship with this place in Manchester uh, factory uh, do you want to go and play a gig over there because we think you're quite interesting they'll have you so we went to play in manchester and we played um, factory night with the cabaret voltaire and it was that being sent to the factory it was because eric's had a, this reciprocal relationship you know that joy division had come over to play eric's and they were sending bands over there that we met tony wilson and a few weeks afterwards, we were cheeky enough to say, well, we've met him, let's send him a demo, you know. We actually weren't trying to get a label, a, a deal. We were trying to get on um, the Granada Evening News, which he used to have bands on occasionally. And um, he just phoned us up and said, um, I've got a better idea, I'm starting a label. Do you want to make a record? <laughs> Holly Johnson. What Manchester had and Liverpool didn't have was... Tony Wilson, who was, you know, a local television personality, and that helped them along considerably. And um, Big in Japan appeared on What's On, his television programme, and Tony would come over to Liverpool and sort of filch off the conceptualism of Roger Eagle and uh, Pete Fulwell. But Roger and Pete weren't as ambitious as Tony uh, and had um, I suppose a, a much more laid back way of working you know that they weren't trying to build an empire a, mus a musical empire in the same way as Tony was Three, five, oh, one, two, five, go. Pete Fall has said to me since uh, that uh, Tony Wilson rather ran away with the sausages uh, insofar as he took the business plan that Peter had produced and released the Joy Division tracks as a single. And I'm told, although I've never seen it, that uh, the first 500 pressings still bear the Eric's Factory artwork. Importantly though, Eric's was a centre for creativity. Like the cavern before it, the club provided a stage for talented local bands to explore their musical horizons. 
However, the late 70s saw an increase in clubland violence in Liverpool, and although Eric's had kept out of trouble, it was raided in March 1980. After some minor arrests, the club was closed for the rest of the evening. But Eric's had mounting debts and nervous investors, and this was the last straw. The club did not reopen. There was a massive raid. Uh, there were about, I can't remember, 20, 30 police. They were all kind of dressed as punks, or what they thought were punks. <laughs> this was quite funny. They were wearing badges uh, uh, that, for the band the police. <laughs> they came in. That was the funny bit. But then they, they, they quite badly manhandled a lot of the people that were there. It was, you know, quite uh, aggressive, the way they dealt with things. Um, and I saw a lot of people who I knew to be, you know, harmless uh, people, good-natured, good-hearted people being treated, you know, badly. Yeah, and it still, you know, still hurts that one. It was, it was horrific. But obviously the consequence of that was, I don't think at the time they intended to close us down. I think they were making an example of us. We weren't club land really, we were music biz rather than club biz. So they didn't have to run up against the, you know, the politics of club land in Liverpool at that time, which was pretty horrific. Uh, and, uh, but they didn't know how vulnerable we were. Um, and of course when the um, word got out to the creditors that we'd had this big raid, they all wanted their money at once and that brought us down. Suddenly it was over. It's hard 30 years after the event to pinpoint exactly why Eric's was unique, but where else would you have been able to see Devo, The Clash or Talking Heads play a matinee? Where else would have launched the careers in just over three years of bands like Teardrop Explodes, Echo and the Bunnymen, Wild Heat and Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark? And where else would have sown the seeds for Frankie Goes to Hollywood, the Lightning Seeds and the KLF? And that's without mentioning the influence this activity had on subsequent generations of musicians. Among them, Space. The Lars. Jack. And the Zootons. Tonight but four. Eric's was a small place with a huge legacy. On that note, a few observations on how life might have been had Messrs Eagle, Testy and Fulwell decided not to bother. Fate up against your will. The Bunny Men's Will Sargent. I mean, I was addicts, there'd be no point in them. No. Well, look, we, we wouldn't ever have met. What would there have been? That just would have been prog rock and hard rock and stuff like that. Andy McCluskey from OMD. I always tell to people, if Eric's hadn't existed, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark would never have even existed. We actually invented the band to play a Thursday night at Eric's. <laughs> Holly from Frankie Goes to Hollywood. It was the most fun part of my car musical career in the sense, you know, it was just doing it purely for the love of music and that passionate part of your teenage years lived out on that little Eric stage. Dave Balfe from The Teardrop Explodes. I'm incredibly glad I had that at the tail end of my teenage years. We had this explosion of creativity with an explosion of wild, weird people uh, doing wild, weird things and then going on to make careers out of them. Big in Japan's Jane Casey. It's about the time of your life, isn't it? That moment when a generation hits the scene, where they reject what they've come from and they create something new. That's the revolution that happens in Britain. It's the only revolution. It's kind of really vital and really important. Yorkie from Space. Eric's taught you, don't be blinkered. I mean, there's nothing worse when you meet people and you, you know, what, what music do you listen to? I only listen to metal. I only listen to this. And it's like, you're doing yourself a great disservice there, you know? It's like, every genre has like, it's, it's plus points, you know? Just lying smiling in the dark. Lightning Seed, Martin Campbell. I don't, I don't know if I would have become a musician without that, that local thing of it being possible. 
I'd still have been into music and all that, but I don't think I'd have become a musician. I, I don't know, I'd probably be locked up somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> The KLF's Bill Drummond. He said to a journalist once, he, he asked me, why do I think there's this, this very street driven pun? I decided, oh, that's because there's this ley line, interstellar ley line. It hits the world at uh, Iceland, kind of moves around through space, comes right down Matthew Street, and then goes off up into space again, and leaves the world properly at New Guinea. And I just made it up as fast as I'm just telling you now. But that seems to have stuck and, and has been picked up and spread around. Teardrop explode, Paul Simpson. I think Bill Drummond's theory of the, the converging ley lines isn't that far-fetched. I think there, there is some magical portal there that could create um, both the cavern and, and Eric's, you know. This is the last song you'll ever hear by the Liverpool crew in Eric's. It's called Other Boys. Yeah. <laughs> Testy. In my wildest dreams, I mean, I, I knew that we would be helping to form opinions, helping to educate in some way, but you can't uh, legislate for the amount of output uh, that Eric's achieved in its few short years because it's, it's a long and very impressive list. Pete Fulwell. It was the spirit was the thing that we were most into. What they were really being influenced by was the, the spirit that we were trying to engender in the club, the culture of the place, which to us was what punk actually was. It was opening up to new opportunities. Punk wasn't really a style of music. It wasn't really a style of dress. It was a spirit, and a spirit that goes way back and will hopefully go way forward. It just takes on different clothes in different shapes at different times but it's um, it was the spirit that was important was Pete Wiley it was the perfect combination of a great promoter a great venue great music and a great crowd most of those guys and girls who came through Eric's are still creative making music doing positive good things you know vital club incredible club beautiful club and I'm really glad I was there The story of Eric's was a document production for 88 to 91 FM, BBC Radio 2.